over the hills and far away, Teletubbies come to play. One, One. two, two. Three. three, four. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Teletubbies! What got you into acting, David, originally? Um, well, uh, when I was at school, in junior school, my mother was dying of melanoma cancer. Oh, right. And I think they gave me, when I was eight, I think they gave me a part in the school play to sort of like take my mind off what was going on because yeah. it took a five years to die. Oh. And I, they gave me the part of Aslan the Lion in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Right. And the following year, um, I think she probably had died by then. Uh, they gave me the part of the Pied Piper in the Pied Piper of Hamlin. Right. And um, I also, I think my parents were quite um, what we call snobbish. Right. And so they paid extra. When I was at junior school, they paid extra for me to go to elocution lessons, which is about, right. you know, speaking. Because I think they wanted to sort of go up the social ladder. Hmm. Uh, I come from sort of an uneducated, sort of fairly working class peasant sort of background. Right. Um, my sister and I were the first people in our entire uh, extended family to get a degree. Oh, right. But that was obviously because of the efforts of my father uh, and, and in earlier days, my mother. So anyway, I went to the allocution classes, but they were actually run by this really amazing woman called Miss Davis, who mm. I think had been an actress and she was a teacher. And so she took us on these really things which were way ahead of the time, things like getting in. This is in the elocution lessons, which was supposedly learning how to speak the Queen's English. And um, uh, she'd have us doing things like lying on our backs and closing our eyes and going through relaxation and guided visualizations and things like that. Hmm. And she also told us that she'd once been extremely ill and she'd had a dream. She'd been in hospital, sort of like at death's door in a coma. And she'd had a dream where she was walking through a beautiful garden on a lovely, perfect summer's day. Hmm. And she came across, as she was walking on the path through this beautiful garden, she came across a bench with an old man with a long white beard and long white hair sitting on the bench. And he said, would you like to stay with me in my beautiful garden? And she said, no, I've got to get back because I've got friends and people I love and things to do. And he said, OK. And then she recovered and lived and then went on to teach me elocution in inverted commas. <laughs> so um, that sort of got me into um, acting and drama and that sort of thing. And I also did a theatre studies A level, um, hmm. but a lot of it it wasn't because I was good at drama or acting. 
it was because I was no good at anything else. <laughs> it was the only thing that I was sort of any good at or the only thing I sort of fitted in at with. Because I was sort of like, you know, a ship without a rudder. I know nowadays they make ships without rudders, but I mean, this was a ship without a rudder in the days when ships needed rudders. Right. <laughs> they had little, um, little pods, you know, electric motor pods that sticking out the bottom of the hull and point in any direction. Um, but, uh, and they don't need a rudder. But anyway, I needed a rudder and I didn't really have one. And mm. um, I was hated school. I went to a grammar school, which was a sort of an old fashioned. It was trying to be like a public school, but it wasn't. Mm. It was just a grammar school, um, and, you know, a state school. And um, the masters, as, as we had to call them, used to wear the, the gowns, you know, and it was all like trying to be like an old fashioned public school in a very mm. old building. Yeah. Had been a con and I just hated it, hated every minute of it. I was... I was average at English and almost bottom of the class in everything else. Right. I absolutely hated it. Um, I'd even, at the age of 14, I'd like play truant and go into the local squat and smoke dope with the hippies. Right. Um, and um, so my, uh, and, and we, I ended up doing A-level a, a theatre studies and A-level English literature as a college of further education, where it was mm. like sort of sixth form college. And there was a, another visionary teacher who I'm still friends with for now, and he's in his 80s, called Gordon Ballins. And he had written the syllabus for the uh, A-level theatre studies. Hmm. And uh, he taught us drama and theatre, but again, in an amazing way, where it wasn't just teaching drama and theatre. It was like sort of expanding our consciousness and making us alive to all sorts of things, which otherwise we wouldn't have been aware of. Mm. And in that course, in that um, uh, on that course, in the first week, the beginning of it was a two year course, you know, like sixth form, mm. when you're sort of, you know, 16, 15, 15, whatever it is, 16, 18, I don't know. But anyway, uh, I was 16 and um, we were divided into two sort of groups. So there was it was the Department of Drama and Liberal Arts. So there was DLA one, and DLA two. And um, actually, I think it might have been we were in DLA 3 and DLA 4. But anyway, uh, the, we had a movement teacher, which is sort of like modern dance type stuff. And on a Friday afternoon, she'd um, uh, our, our movement or dance class would consist of her turning all the lights down in the drama studio and playing soothing music. Right. And then getting us all to, again, lie on our backs with our eyes closed <laughs> and, and, and do sort of, you know, relaxation and guided visualizations. And then she'd get people to to choose another partner, partner, and then we people would take it in terms to massage each other. Oh. Now, obviously, obviously, you know, all the guys, well, maybe not obviously, but no, you know, like the heterosexual guys try to get <laughs> a, a, a sexual girl, yeah, and um, uh, obviously to have a nice massage. You didn't really want a, another bloke, you know. Well, unless you were gay, which I wasn't. And um, uh, I was talking to. And a bloke who was had the same age as me and had just joined this uh, drama, this theatre studies A level course. Mm. And he was in DLA four. If I was in DLA three, we were in different ones. And when we were talking, we confided in each other, or I I confided in him that I was usually the one left out. If there was an odd number, I was the one who didn't get picked to um, <laughs> do the And he said, "That's strange because I'm the same. <laughs> I'm also <laughs> the one, who picked out, and I'm not picked." And we became really good friends. Mm. And his name was Ben Elton. Ah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you um, go from that to getting your first role? Uh, sorry, say that again. Sorry, um, how did you go from, from that uh, to getting your first role? Uh, well, um, um, I should say maybe that I'm in Cambodia and you're in Glasgow, so that's why I had to say pardon, because the, <laughs> the Wi-Fi is not great. We're using a... A hotel Wi-Fi. Yeah, I am. Um, well, um, first professional role. Mm. Okay, well, that was a bit of a long from there because after doing the th the A level theatre studies course, I took a year off and mm. basically lived what some smoked huge amounts of uh, hashish and marijuana, and then I did a degree in theatre at Dartington College of Arts which was run by another visionary <laughs> woman <laughs> called, um, King, who created this amazing four-year degree course. And um, I did that course. And one of the extra things we had to do was we had to do choose a related study. 
and it was like the performing arts of India and Japan or theater design or something or therapeutic drama and I chose therapeutic drama hmm. and that and because the, co the college was in Devon in South Devon I ended up going as a volunteer uh one afternoon a week it may, might have been two afternoons a week to a mental hospital on Dartmoor and it was a classic sort of old-fashioned loony bin mental hospital obviously hmm. now it's been converted into uh, luxury flats but uh it was um it was a big Victorian sort of mausoleum up on Dartmoor and it was symmetrical in design. At one time, there'd been a wall going right down the middle of the grounds, hmm. separating the males from the females. But that had been knocked down by the time I was there. Uh, I mean, I wasn't a patient, but I was going there to, to, as a volunteer. And I went to this um, uh, a ward for chronic schizophrenics. It was basically people who, or men who'd been diagnosed with schizophrenia many years ago. And they'd been in there for so long that they were never going to get out because now the primary problem was there having been institutionalized mm. rather than whatever it was they've been put in for i mean some of them have been put in for things like stealing a pint of milk when they were a teenager you know and they mm. were now like old men with long white hair and long white beards mm. another uh image there of long a man old man with a long <laughs> white hair. um and um uh, anyway so i went in i was really into poetry at the time so i went into this mental hospital into this lock-up ward mm. with a with poetry books uh, and I had this idea of reading poetry to them but obviously these people were so far gone that they were beyond poetry but anyway I, I found that I had an ability to connect with them and um, and mm. make and, and interact with them and, and get them engaged whereas they normally would not be interested at all unless I had a cigarette to give them or something I mean that this was when smoking was allowed in wards and and mm. they would eat cigarettes ends out of the ashtrays and things and they did also other things that people do when they're in mental hospital for a very long time doing things like sticking salt and pepper pots up their bottoms and things like that. Right. Um, I'd say this, probably people like that now would probably just be homeless in the street, wouldn't they? Yeah. But anyway, I'm in a very, this is a very long winded answer to your question, but I did that. And then when I did my degree in theater and I, I graduated, um, even though I sort of wanted to be an actor and a playwright, um, I got distracted by another year of studying mm. Um to learn to be a drama and movement therapist because I showed so much promise at, at making a, a, a connection with people who were, you know, were, were mentally ill. So I studied drama and movement therapy in London for a year. And that also involved going out and working in the field with severely autistic people. I just got a Facebook message. That's the first one I had this year. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I then naturally walked into work because people wanted to pay me to go and do this. So I, I became immediately a professional drama and movement therapist, a self-employed mm. one, specializing with working with the most extremely autistic people and in, with other problems as well. And I, I mean, going into a lock-up ward in a hospital, which again has since been closed down and converted into luxury flats. Uh -huh. It was called Hartford Hospital at the time. It was in Hertfordshire near Radlett. And um, there were people there who used to, you know, ha have been straight jackets. They were put in padded cells. I there was a guy who bitten someone's nose off. Ooh. I used to work with people who used to eat his own face. Um, people who eat their own poo. They eat each other's poo. You know, I mean, like really s severely, um, you know, um, individual. Hmm. And again, I had a massive ability to to do what people thought was amazing stuff with these people. Hmm. So I carried on doing that work, but I knew that really, um, my in my heart, I wanted to be uh, an actor and um, and a playwright. And by then, my very good friend Ben Elton had started to become famous as a stand-up comedian. Hmm. So I also thought, well, you know, if it's good enough for Ben, it's good enough for me. Maybe I'll try. So I then started doing stand-up comedy with spectacularly less successful results than Ben Elton. <laughs> And um, uh, I was able to, as I got paid more for doing gigs, I, I was able to ease out of um, to, to doing this drama and movement therapist work until I was doing no drama and movement therapy work and I was a full-time comedian. But, mm. and here comes the answer to your question, uh, I also, as many comedians were at the time, uh, registered with an agent, an acting agent, uh, because at the time, probably then, and well, probably now, but definitely then, people making TV commercials liked to use comedians because they were used to improvising and they were used to not having a fourth wall. Mm. Whereas uh, classically trained actors, you know, they tend to rely on the fourth wall 
you know, i.e. acting in a play and pretending they don't know the audience is there. Hmm. But uh, people making TV commercials, they like the idea of somebody who's used to looking at people and talking directly to them yeah. whilst performing. So, um, of the first four, as of the first three auditions I went to for TV commercials, I got two of them. So that is a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> it was uh, uh, in a, bar, a a commercial for Barclays Bank, hmm. which was quite controversial at the time because they were still investing in South Africa, and so therefore you were totally uncool if you had a bank account with Barclays, and even more uncool if you didn't advert for them. But yeah. I got paid four and a half thousand quid for the day. So oh, it's not bad. <laughs> so... that, that was a lot then, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a lot now, but it, it was even more then before, you know, gas prices and everything had gone up and inflation was as big as it has been since that time. Uh, you might notice that I'm not telling you the year when I was doing these things, and that's because I feel embarrassed about how old I am. <laughs> what year was it? <laughs> uh, it was 1983. <laughs> Actually, no, uh, it was, no, it was 1985. Oh, was it? Yeah, 1985 when I did my first... That's when I first started doing stand-up, was 1985. Ah. Well, you were the part in the Ben Elton film Baby Baby as well, didn't you? Yeah, he wrote a part for me, hmm. the day comedian, and I was in a scene with Hugh Laurie. And um, also, uh, I saw that they had another character called Mrs Furblob, which was um, a costume character. And obviously, I had done work in a costume. And so I said, hey, you know, whoever that part's going to, can you cancel them? Because I could do that. And they gave it to me. So I actually played two parts. I played Dave right. the Comedian, mm. which was a part written specially for me by Van Elton. And I also played Mrs. Furblob and got the paid <laughs> same money as I got paid <laughs> by <laughs> Dave the Comedian. So how did all this lead to the telly to be said? Yes. Well, it's funny because... I'm in Southeast Asia at the moment doing stand-up mm. gigs, and um, uh, they say it's hard to be a prophet in your own land. And if people are bothered in the slightest about the fact that I was in the Tinky Winky costume in the Teletubbies in Britain, outside Britain, it's much, much, much more important to people. Mm. And the Chinese go mad for it. So I did a gig uh, in Kuala Lumpur, and after the gig, it took an hour getting through the queue of Chinese people wanting selfies. Right. They right. weren't all Chinese. It was Malaysia. But um, a lot of them were Chinese because there were a lot of Chinese people in Malaysia. Some of them were Indian. Some of them were Malay. Mm. Um, and um, I just did, uh, la a few days ago, on Friday night, I did a gig in uh, Saigon, Ho Chi Minh mm. City. And the promoter... Um, you know, he's got a room, he puts his comedy shows in and he started advertising the thing and he used the Tinky Winky credit, sold all the tickets and so moved to a bigger room and sold the bigger room out and was turning people away. Hmm. And that's not because people wanted to see Dave Thompson. <laughs> that was because people wanted to see the bloke who was in the Tinky Winky costume. <laughs> so when you went for the job, uh, what, what did you know about the, the show before you started, uh, you know, when you very little yeah very little um i if i could just quickly add on another little thing which is that i'm realizing in the last week i'm discovering that what's happened because um with with the teletubbies you know people watch it the program was made for people from baby age up to about three mm. but people often that watch it as well and um so if you're in say you know a sitcom or some tv program that is on and then it goes away. However much fame or, and um, uh, acknowledgement you might get at the time it's being transmitted and is well known, mm. that then goes down and down and down as time goes by, you know, unless possibly it's friends or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So with the telly series, what's happened is that because people were from the age of zero to three when they first watched it, as they get older, they then become of pub age and can afford, you know, can get into bars and buy drink and go mm. to comedy shows so that actually becomes more of a thing so as time goes on instead of it being you know didn't you used to be tinky winky even though i did used to be tinky winky um because i'm not doing it now but it actually gets bigger 
are more important because those people who watched it when they were very young are now adults. And mm. what I've discovered the last week is that that is actually increasing because as more and more um, people who watched it as they were babies reach adulthood, which they, more and more people do every year, there are more people who go, oh, you know, Tinky Winky from the telly service, you know, I'll buy a ticket or whatever. So mm. it's actually get, there's more and more people and it becomes more and more important to people, even though it be, it's also further away in time. This mm. is very odd. I've only realised that in the last week. Uh, so anyway, sorry, um, your question was, what did I know about it? Yeah. Well, what happened was um, I was in Harry Hill's first ever TV series. Yeah. Uh, which was called Harry Hill's Fruit Fancies, and it was just little 10-minute or maybe even five-minute, I can't remember, um, programmes on BBC Two, little short programmes in black and white, and I think they were silent. And um, I was in various roles in various episodes of this thing, this series, and one of the characters I was, was given to play was an Egyptian mummy. And when they put me in the Egyptian mummy costume. The costume lady actually sewed the bandages over my eyes and over my face. So I couldn't come out uh, um, until they snipped the stitches and let me back out again when, mm. when they finished in front of the cameras. And the people said, you know, don't you find feel claustrophobic being trapped inside this uh, mummy costume? And I said, no, you know, maybe I'm a bit on the spectrum, but I actually feel very <laughs> safe and comfortable in here. Yeah, and there was a guy who was a runner on that show, which is the entry level job in television, where you're basically running and getting people cups of tea and possibly not even being paid. Hmm. And he went on up the ladder of the television career scale to become the production manager of a program called Telly Teddies, which they were going to make until they discovered that Telly Teddies was a copyrighted word in America and they changed the title to Telly Tubbies. And uh, ironically, later on, the people who own the copyright to the word Teletedis then made a series called Teletedis to sort of um, swing on the coattails of the Teletubbies. Hmm. But um, at that time, anyway, they changed it to Teletubbies and they and he asked, he remembered about how I wasn't phased about being in a costume and he phoned me up and said, would you want to come and do an audition for this children's TV programme in, I'm involved in? Hmm. And obviously this was before you know, it was even started to be made. And um, I said, yeah, OK. And uh, I gave it very little thought because, you know, kids TV pro programme, I'm a stand up comedian. I want to become a Hollywood film star, you know, and be a mm. big name comedian. I don't want to be in a kids TV show. So I didn't really give it much um, credence. But I went to the audition and out of uh, over 400 people who they auditioned for the part of Tinky Winky, they gave me the, the role. Hmm. What did you have to do in the audition? Well, um, the audition was at the Welsh Centre, which is a sort of a building where Welsh people go, I suppose, <laughs> just uh, near King's Cross Station. And they obviously, to make a bit of money, they would hire out the rooms for auditions for mm. you know, companies and theatre companies or whatever. And when uh, I said, yes, I'll do the audition, this guy, uh, who's called Nick, Kirkpatrick, who went on to become the worldwide head of BBC marketing, um, he said it's on Friday, and I said, "Oh, well, that's not good because I've got a gig in Bristol on Friday, and I want to get out and get on the M4 before the rush hour traffic builds up on a Friday afternoon going out of London." Hmm. And he said, "And he said, well, it's uh, he said you can come in the morning, and he said, but it's an all day workshop." And I said, "Ah, well, I'm not going to stay for the whole day because um, you know I, I want to get in the car and start driving towards." the m4 in bristol hmm. obviously i didn't realize what a big gig this was <laughs> and i was prioritizing a you know a gig in um jester's comedy club in bristol uh over this audition but anyway i went um and it was a one day workshop but i only did it for the morning and then left um and what we were required to do was prepare um a little five minute bit about um childhood a little five minute bit um, aimed for children under five. And then the rest of it was workshop interaction where they told us to interact with each other and, and stuff. And um, I thought I had a gig on the Thursday night as well doing stand up comedy. So I didn't get round to planning the stuff for the audition. Hmm. And then I left the house much later than I planned. And I thought, OK, well, I'll just plan it on the tube. You know, when I'm on the tube and going hmm. across London, I'll um, uh, get my notebook and pen out and I'll scribble the notes and I'll plan my audition bits 
on the way to King's Cross. But it was rush hour and it was packed, you know, absolutely packed. So it was standing room only, sort of like, you know, like a mm. of sardine. Thing. So I couldn't plan it. So when I got to the workshop, I just um, uh, did five minutes of stand-up comedy material about camp going to France. But mm. I, st- I started it off with when I was a child, we used to go on holiday to France. And then hope that they wouldn't notice that it was not it had nothing to do with childhood. It was about going to France. And I just said when I was a kid, we used to go on holiday to France to sort of justify it. Um, and the other bit for children under five, I improvised. And I used to at the time have um, um, a, a made to measure red lycra like leotard and tights, hmm. which I used to do, use. I used to do a, um, a send up of postmodern dance in my stand up act. I'd strip off. And to reveal the leotard and tights, and then I do this send up a postmodern dance. In my innocence, I didn't realize that if you're going to do a send up of something, you need to to uh, satirize something which people know about and they understand the reference. And of course, <laughs> most people didn't know about postmodern dance, and therefore I was satirizing something they'd never heard of. Uh, and obviously, if you're doing some you know tough gig in Yorkshire. Uh, <laughs> it's not gonna it's not gonna go down well with the audience when you strip off and start pouncing around in a le- leotard and tights but i didn't know that at the time anyway it lost me at the comedy store from that routine uh, don ward who owned the comedy store stopped booking me when he saw me doing it but anyway um the point is that i took my leotard and tights with me and i got changed into my leotard and tights and then when i got called up to do my little bits for aimed at five-year-old children i just rolled across the floor into the middle of the floor and then um stood up and said hello children um mm-hmm. i'm going to be a seed and i'm going to grow into a tree and then i um you know went into the sort of embryonic position mm-hmm. and then gradually that became a, you know i was a became a seed and then i gradually grew into a tree um and um the woman who owns the company, Rag Doll, that made the Teletubbies, plus lots of other shows like um, Brum, Rosie and Jim, Tots TV, before the Teletubbies, and then after the Teletubbies in the Night Garden, um, she was there auditioning us. And obviously she saw something that she thought, you know, let's look, let's see him a second time. Um, they didn't want to just get what they called skin actors, because usually when someone's got a role like that, they just get someone who specialises in doing what they call skin acting, where they put on a gorilla costume or an R2-D2 costume or mm. a Darth Vader costume or whatever it is. Um, but she didn't want skin actors. She wanted to have people who brought some sort of individual part of themselves mm. to the role. And we were encouraged in the sort of pre-production process to sort of find our inner child and then release our inner child into the character that we were doing, in my case, mm. to Winky. And in my case, of course, my inner child got uh, chewed up and spat out. <laughs> and I've never recovered from it since. So so how did, when you started filming, uh, how, how did the uh, day filming go? Because it was filming segments, wasn't it, that could be repeated? Yeah, well, it started very early. We mm. it, it was all filmed in the corner of a, a field on a farm just on the edge of the Cotswolds and South Warwickshire, a few miles south of Stratford-on-Avon, hmm. where Shakespeare was born. And um, we stayed, well, Dipsy, John Simmett, fantastic bloke who's also a stand-up comic, he lived in Birmingham, so he used to get bussed in uh, by taxi from his house in Birmingham every morning. Hmm. But the other three of us all lived in London at the time. That was uh, La La Poe and Tinky Winky. And so they put us up in a very beautiful country house hotel in a little village called Mickleton. Mm. And we would basically live from Sunday evening until Friday afternoon in this lovely country house hotel because we mm. filmed Monday to Friday. And I had the sort of penthouse suite, you know, in the end. And mm. I was living in this beautiful sort of penthouse suite. Um, and um, so we'd get up and drive in to the location from the Country House Hotel, which would probably be about 10 minutes drive, hmm. park up uh, in the sort of by the field, and then um, go into, uh, what would we do? We, we'd uh, I, I'd sometimes get there really early, and I would um, do yoga and Aikido, key development exercises and key breathing and stuff. 
Hmm. Um, before we then had a script reading, we and and people laugh at this, but every word and every o and uh, run away and all the other little things that so everything was scripted and rehearsed. So we would um, go into our sort of dressing room. There'd be like a green room area. Everything was hmm. in porter cabin because it was you know in the middle of the farm, um, and we'd read through the script, hmm. and then we'd go into costume. Uh, not with the head on, but into sort of the preliminary costume. And then at, when they started filming, we would then get called in front of the cameras as and when we were needed. And mm. then there would be heads on. And we we ha all had two dressers. We had two dressers each. And we also had colour-coded um, cotton uh, dressing gowns. So they bought all of us a, a white cotton dressing gown. And then Dipsy's was dyed green. Mine was dyed purple. Lala's yellow. <laughs> and so nice. on. Um, so we we would have underclothes hmm. and the others opted for sort of like um, human made artificial fibres, which was some sort of like thing that people wear when they're mountaineering or something under their trousers or something like that. I didn't want that. I'm not like that. So I, I, I wanted cotton. So I had um, white cotton Aikido trousers, which are the same as what you have for, for karate as well. Then they bought several pairs for me. And then I had white cotton long sleeved um, T-shirts. Hmm. with a crew neck from Racing Green who've since uh, gone out of business uh, so I, I had different things I had all cotton and we put those on and then we put the dressing gowns on and then hmm. the first stage of into costume would be having two dresses put us into the costume but not the paws or the head and then the next stage, the next level of readiness would be the paws and the head on hmm. and uh, sometimes we uh we'd rest with the head on and I, I mean i often fell asleep because obviously there was a sort of padding and stuff inside so it was actually very comfortable and you could easily sleep you know you didn't need a pillow because there was a thing behind the head a sort of you know foam right. and rubber so um you could actually sleep quite comfortably with the head on and we mm -hmm. did many hours um we'd sleep um but also like when they got to a certain point they say okay heads off and then the dressers would remove our heads and our paws mm -hmm. um and that was a sort of, you know, the slightly lower stage of readiness. It was very much like being a fighter pilot on, you know, ready to be scrambled and take mm -hmm. off and intercept some Russian uh, Russian planes that were encroaching on British airspace. <laughs> was it um, a really hot costume to wear, though? It was very hot. And um, uh, I, I sometimes wonder if I should have, if, uh, if ever I have a grave, on the gravestone should be carved, was it hot in the costume? <laughs> um, it was very very hot yeah. and uh especially as it was shot in the summer uh and you know, it was it, apart from a few of the shots for the front titles and end titles and things it was all shot on location and so they shot during the summer and the first summer of shooting it was sort of a heat wave hmm. and um uh, i remember coming out of costume and wringing out my um aikido trousers and my long sleeve cotton t-shirt wow. we got like well over a pint and a half of sweat out of them and we, we'd then be given fresh ones you know when we broke for lunch we'd come out in the costume and put our dressing gowns on but mm. we'd be given fresh underclothes for the afternoon and because the um the it was all this foam rubber you know because of the costume around us it couldn't be washed you know the, the inner clothes could be washed but the actual big costumes that you see yeah. they really couldn't be washed so they were put into a dehumidifier overnight to take all the dampness out of them from our sweat yeah, but um, they they couldn't be cleaned. So after a while, we stank like people who hadn't had a bath for two or three years. Right. And obviously, the next question is: um, Could you go to the toilet in them? And not literally in them, but could you? <laughs> well, you could. You could. You would technically. You could have a wee in them. Mm. I never did. I can't speak for the others. Probably <laughs> not. Um, it would be a bit unpleasant if you had a poo in them, and, and I think other people would definitely notice. <laughs> um, and I never did that. <laughs> and I didn't like it. Could you see out of the? I mean, you you must have been able to see out of the suit. How did you do that? No, you could only see through the mouth because the eyes were up here. I was eight foot tall with the aerial, yeah. so the eyes were sort of up here, and and the um the the mouth was level with our eyes. Yeah. So when the mouth was open, you could see, but with very very restricted view. When the mouth was closed, we couldn't see. So when they're walking along and doing anything with their mouth closed, they're actually doing it, judging it by memory or intuition or 
mm. some sort of bird-like navigation uh, ability. Mm. Did you manage to get any input at all into the scripts? Uh, well, funnily enough, um, Anne Wood, who was like the power in behind the whole show, you know, it was sort of her idea. She mm. owned the company. She was a producer. She was the all-powerful person. Mm. And um, she, uh, I, I usually describe her as being like a combination of Queen Elizabeth I and Margaret Thatcher. Mm. And like many people who are very high achievers, she was an amazing person and I have massive respect for her. Mm. But those people can be like the sun, you know. They light up a huge area around them um, and fuel worlds. <laughs> mm. But if you get close to them, you can get quite badly burned. Mm. And um, when in the process, it was there was a huge pre-production time before it when actually started they started filming it mm. there was anyway but also this was elongated because the uh, costumes were made they cost thirty thousand pounds each at the time the costumes oh, wow. and they were made with um sort of all this expanded polystyrene or foam whatever it was and then they had this fur and the fur it came from america and it was two-way stretch fabric mm. and at the time it was the only place in the world where you could get two-way stretch fabric because you could get stretch fabric but it would only stretch one way but this stretched mm. two ways and the, it was late being delivered by months and as a result because we didn't have the fur to finish the costumes off we were all on salary and they had to find us something for us to do you know and they had got mm. a, they got um johnny hutch who used to play the little bold man in the benny hill, benny hill program they got him in to teach us crowning and all sorts of things mm. but anyway um, to get to your answer to your question i've actually forgotten what it was what was the question Oh, did you have any inputs into the scripts? <laughs> oh, the, oh, the scripts, that's right, yeah. So anyway, in all this time, I got really friendly with Anne. You know, there was nothing mm. romantic. She was a lot older than me, but uh, and she was married. But um, uh, I, we got really good friends. You know, I, I was, we, I'd lend her books and stuff, and, and we had, you know, good conversations. And when she was in London, we'd meet up, and she'd, you know, meet me in a very expensive restaurant and obviously pay for the meal and everything. And um, she said to me, I'd like you to write scripts, you know, and, and mm. submit some, some scripts. So I did. And I wrote some ideas you know, for scripts um, and they all got rejected. And understandably so, because at that time I didn't really quite grasp what the whole programme was about. Mm. So they all got rejected and I quite understand why they did. But some of the ideas, I think, were quite good. And um, years later, even though, no, I didn't have an input on the scripts because all the ones I wrote got rejected and i you know i understand why mm. but uh years later uh i was doing stand-up comedy and i was in some uh you know horrible little cheap bed and breakfast um somewhere in you know lincolnshire or wherever it might have been uh having done a gig the night before and i was getting ready to check out of this bed and breakfast place and the little telly was on the bracket on the wall and i had the telly on and the telly tubbies was that were on and what do i see but I see my <laughs> thing mm -hmm. that I've written and submitted, but obviously ah. never got paid. Yeah. yeah. What was the salary like, if you don't mind me asking, to be a toe to be? Um, they paid us um, six hundred pounds a week. Hmm. Um, I think throughout the year, all year, even though it was only filmed in the sort of summer, spring, and early autumn, hmm. um, and. That was to include unlimited overtime. So it wasn't actually an equity contract. At the time, it seemed pretty good, you know, as a gigging stand-up comedian. Mm. Uh, it seemed okay, 600 quid a week. And also, of course, at the weekends, I could do stand-up gigs. And I even did them in the week. Mm. I was a regular player of a comedy club at Cadillac's nightclub in Bath. Right. Uh, and on Thursday evenings, I'd come out of costume, um, you know, run to the shower, have a shower, put my civilian clothes on and drive 80 miles to do a gig and be a regular compo. So I had to do new material. Hmm. And then I do that, have a couple of pints afterwards, get in the car, drive back to the hotel, get there at, you know, 1.32 in the morning, have a hmm. three or four hours sleep, get up, be back on location the next day. But I hmm. didn't feel tired because I was so high. I love doing stand-up and I was so high with this uh, feeling that we were making this really incredibly important TV programme hmm. that uh, one just ran on adrenaline and enthusiasm. Because we did know at the time it was going to be 
a world famous, massively groundbreaking show. And that mm. might sound arrogant, but the reason we knew was because Rag Doll was such a clever and um, professional company. Mm. When they made the program, they did so much research where they would show preview tapes of programs to, I suppose, what you'd now call focus groups, that um, they knew that. You know, but basically what they did was they funded nurseries all over Britain and their oh, deal was yeah. they fund the nursery if they could show their preview tapes of the programmes they made to the kids in the nursery whilst filming the kids so hmm. they'd, they'd have a TV show, oh I've got another Facebook message they'd have a TV <laughs> um, showing the programme a preview, hmm. not that they hadn't transmitted to these little kids in a nursery with a camera on top and as part of our training, because they we were waiting for the two-way stretch fabric, they um, showed us tapes shot from you know from a, a TV camera on top of a telly of little kids. And and one they showed it was all these little kids, you know, sitting cross-legged, three-year-old kids, um, and they're watching the TV, which is sort of underneath the camera that's filming them. And then after a while, one little kid loses concentration and crawls away, and then another kid gets distracted by him, and then another kid on the other side of the group loses concentration. And they said, that one we know we're not going to transmit. And then they showed another one where all of the kids hmm. are riveted to the screen for all of the time. And they said, if we get that response in every nursery, we send the preview tape out from Northern Ireland to Kent, from Cornwall to Aberdeen. Hmm. And they deliberately chose nurseries that covered all of the sort of socioeconomic um, uh, spectrum. Hmm. They said that we know when we transmit that program, 100% certain that is going to be a massive hit hmm. and that's the level of their preparation and their professionalism hmm. and uh, because we'd sort we you know the programs that made before like tots tv and brum and rosie and jim were massively hugely popular programs that had sold all over the world hmm. and so we knew because every time they made a program they'd learn from the first one and then take that knowledge and experience into the next program they made and when they made In the Night Garden after the Teletubbies, they took everything they learned from the Teletubbies and put it into In the Night Garden. So um, we knew that this programme was going to be a worldwide phenomenon. Mm. And that's why when I was doing a gig last week, um, you know, in the Far East, I've got a massive queue of people who want selfies. <laughs> <laughs> so how did it all come to an end then, working on the show? Sorry, what was that? So, um, how did it come to a end? They working on the show. Came to an end because I was fired. Right. I don't ever, you know, pretend otherwise. I don't make any uh, to, you know, yeah. claims about it. Um, I got fired, and I still have the letter. And the letter says that my interpretation of the role had not been accepted. Oh. Yeah. So I don't know. The person who can really answer that question is Anne Wood. Yeah, but uh, there are sort of there are a lot many urban myths about it. There are all sorts of strange, weird stories, mm. um, which say to me, you know, in pubs in various parts of the world, or bars in part, various parts of the world. I sometimes wonder. I do, don't rule out the possibility that the whole thing was planned from the start mm. because it got massive publicity for the program all over mm. the world. Yeah, I mean, when the news came out that I'd been sacked, and the news didn't actually come out until months and months and months later when the program was a massive phenomenon hmm. and uh, when the news came out it caused such a stir that even 10 downing street issued a statement to the press to the media <laughs> yeah. well, not the prime minister himself but 10 downing street did what did it say what did they say yeah i think it said um that everybody in 10 downing street and their children love watching the telly subbies and they're very sad to see dave sack Oh, right. Well, <laughs> because of what happens is the media treat something as if it's just happened, you know. So, even though I've yeah. been fired on the 1st of November the previous year, uh, it didn't come out until the following July. Mm. And the media, though they knew that I'd been fired on the 1st of November the previous year, they didn't care about that. They're very selective in what they choose to pass on to the public. Mm. So, they all all without exception, treated it as if it had just happened. Right. So, of course, the response from the public and all the celebrities who got interviewed was, you know, 
Dave does a great job as Tinky Winky, and uh, we're all terribly upset that he's been sacked. Hmm. And Dave was also very upset that he was sacked. <laughs> so did you clear your what I did was, even though when I got the job, I thought it was my big break. Yeah. Uh, because I love doing stand-up comedy, I continued doing stand-up comedy. It was business as usual in the stand-up comedy department. Right. Every weekend, and I was doing stand-up comedy. So when I got fired, I just carried on doing stand-up comedy. Hmm. Um, and um, so, you know, it wasn't like I was out of work or anything, because I just carried on doing the job that I was doing before I got given the job. Right. Do you have any regrets about the show at all? I do. Um, I do have regrets. Um, I regret having been sacked. Hmm. Um, I... If I had known then what I know now, in some ways I would have behaved slightly differently. Hmm. Um, but having said that, um, I don't think I was sacked, you know, for any personal reason because of my behaviour. I think I was sacked for professional reasons, and yeah. the professional reasons were to do with um, my performance and what have you. You know, I think Anne Wood. I mean, Anne Wood. When I when I um, got the part. I, I was, you know, obviously euphoric because I was looking at the money. I thought it was going to be my big break. But um, uh, I'm, I've met people who had worked with or knew people who had worked with Anne Wood and Ragdoll before. Mm. And they said, you, you want to be careful because they or she eat people up and chew them up and, and then spit mm. them out. And I was given a couple of examples of people who experienced that. Yeah. including the guy who did Postman Pat. Right. And even with, um, um, I mean, this was a different era, and I think probably they could do things now that they wouldn't get away with nowadays. So, for example, it was it was common or not unusual that somebody who worked in the office could walk in one morning and be told to have their desk empty by midday. Mm. You know, that was they were gone. Um, and I mentioned earlier that we had the guy, the little bold guy in the Benny Hill programs. Mm. Benny Hill used to sit head and used, you know, used to treat as a sort of a stooge. Well, when he was um, coming and taking all these various sort of clowning sessions with us, um, it was, you know, our wonderful Johnny. And then uh, he disappeared um, on one of the sort of many lunches that we were having with Anne in a restaurant in Stratford-on-Avon during the pre-production period. I just said, um, oh, by the way, we haven't seen Johnny for a while. What happened to Johnny? And there was a silence. And then Anne said, well, we're not friends with Johnny anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Johnny had been fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so um, yeah, I, I, I think that unfortunately i must have done something or said something which Anne didn't like yeah and got down on me and we went from being friends who mm. would change books with each other you know have a hug when we saw each other to me starting to think she's not giving me eye contact in the script read script readings mm. and um, um, she came to me one day and she said um the woman that the woman who at the BBC who commissioned the program, so it was made by an independent company called Ragdoll. Yeah, it was commissioned by um, a woman called um, I think she's called Anna Home or Anna Holmes. And Anne said to me, uh, Anna Holmes at the BBC doesn't like your performance. I'm fighting tooth and nail to keep you in the show. And then she went off to sell the show to Japan. Hmm. And then Anna Home or Anna Holmes, I never could never remember how the name's pronounced. She sent her number two, her assistant, uh, to the location one day. And I'd met her and spoken to her quite a few times. And she was very nice. And Anne wasn't there. She was in Japan. So I went up to this woman. I forget what her name was, Judy or Judith. And I said, I'm so sorry you don't like my performance because all I'm doing is what the director says I should do. You know, mm. As long as the director says, that's great, do that. That's what I'm going to do. You know, mm. That's what actors do. Um, and her jaw dropped. And she said, I'm really sorry, Dave, but I've no idea what you're talking about. Uh, it's standard practice that we at the BBC don't see anything until there's an edited episode for us to watch. And mm -hmm. as you know, there is no edit ed edited episode yet, and there won't be for a while. So we haven't seen your performance. So mm -hmm. we haven't said that we don't like it. That was, story was a total contradiction of what Anne had told me. So mm -hmm. one of them must have been lying. Well, it right. turned out it was Anne who was lying. 
Yeah. And that was like starting, that was the start of the sort of softening up. She knew she was going to sack me. Yeah. And that was the sort of um, I mean, someone recently said to me who knew me at the time, they said, you know, basically they gaslighted you. And yeah. I suppose that's what they did. They gaslighted me. Yeah. Hmm. And it wasn't me, just me. Loads of people got fired at the time. Yeah. You know, the axe came out and heads rolled. The new new got fired, the guy in the new new. The designer got fired, who mm. was a part owner of the company. He was called Bob Burke, and he designed Monty Python. Oh, well. <laughs> he got fired. The art director got fired, and his next job was being the art director on the feature film Titanic. Bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> so um Max Clifford got in touch with you, didn't he, after the show? Max Clifford, yeah, that was what happened was that um uh I just carried on doing stand-up comedy after mm. I'd been sacked. And then um the program started being transmitted and it made a huge, huge, huge impact. It became mm. absolutely mad. Um I was doing um carrying on being stand-up comedy, and there was a there was a double act at the time starring who who consisted of Hugh Dennis, who's now a well-known actor in a famous sitcom, isn't he? Hmm. Can you say what it is? You I can't. I can't remember the show. He was a Ponton and Dennis, though, wasn't he? The power of Ponton and Dennis as well, yeah, wasn't but he? I think he's now, he's an actor and he's, he stars in a sitcom. It's about a family. I don't know because I never watch TV because I'm constantly either flying to a gig or driving up a motorway to a gig or yeah. whatever. I don't know what it is, but I know that he became really famous now as an actor, Hugh Dennis. And mm. the other one was Steve Hunt. Who oh, yeah. also, they both went on. They were a double act on the comedy circuit doing, you know, comedy clubs. But they went on to do TV. They were in the uh, Mary Whitehouse experience with um, mm. Rob Newman and David Baddiel. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I got a phone call out of the blue one day um, from a woman. And she said, hi, my name is Vanessa something. I'm a journalist on The Independent on Sunday. Mm. And I got your phone from Steve Punt and he says that apparently he told me that you're Tinky Winky in the Teletubbies and um, I said well I was but I'm not anymore mm. and I went for an interview and she put that in the Independent on Sunday uh, in about July 1997 and um, at the time I was doing stand-up comedy on the comedy stage oh god I've got a, um, a message I've got, um... sorry do you mind if I accept this yeah it's alright Right. Hi, Dan. Oh, sorry, I'll be posting you. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Um, I, I'm doing a, a, a Zoom interview with someone in Britain at the moment. Oh, OK. I'm doing like a, you know, like a podcast interview. Sorry about that. Is that you're sending me messages as well? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to feed her now, then. Oh, I'm sorry about that. As soon as this is finished, I'm going to come and eat because I haven't eaten yet. I'm starving. OK. All, All right. right cool. We'll be near Amber. OK, I'll see you soon. I'll let you know All when right. I'm coming. Bye. Yeah, cheers. Bye. <laughs> um, five stars. Submit. Okay, sorry about that. Are That's you still with me? I am indeed, yeah. yeah. That was the tour manager. Oh, right. Um, so there you go. I've got you back. Right. That was the tour manager for Cambodia. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, so I was doing stand-up comedy on the comedy stage of a festival mm. in Devon. And John Otway, who's, you know, quite famous, a mm. rock, rock and music star, he was also on, and we were in the same camping enclosure for performers, and I got to know him, and he was a very friendly bloke. And um, I told him about the interview on The Independent on Sunday. It was a Sunday. Mm. And on the, on the Sunday morning, I was sitting in the sort of entrance to my tent, and he walked past my tent. He said, oh, he said, hi, Dave. Um, I read that interview in The Independent on Sunday. It's quite a good interview. Um, now, what happened was, by then, because there was so much interest in the Teletubbies, because it was a huge phenomenon mm. by, by everything transmitted, everybody wanted a Teletubbies story. There was a massive vacuum for anything to do with the Teletubbies. And by then, they closed the set. So nobody was allowed cameras, you know, this mm. was all the days of mobile phones. Only a few people have mobile phones. Um, so there was a, a huge vacuum of any information or photographs or anything for the Teletubbies. So when this... Um, uh, article came out in, in the Independent on Sunday uh, this interview with me all of the tabloids just went crazy so the next day on the Monday morning 
I'm woken up in my tent by people coming up to my tent and sort of opening, unzipping the zip and saying, Dave, your life has changed. And they're waving all these tabloids. And the, every, the front page of every newspaper, including the tabloids, was just nothing but Tinky Winky actor gets fired. Right. And, um, and I lived in a flat in London at the time. Hmm. And uh, uh, my, because I wasn't there, I had journalists outside my front door 24 hours a day. And there, there were photographs of my next door neighbours, this sort of Cockney family, and they were on the on the sort of front pages of the newspapers because they were my next door neighbours. <laughs> a really nice bloke, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, so so I then phoned my acting agent in London, mm. and he said the switchboard has been jammed all day, and the Sun will pay you two thousand pounds opening opening money just to talk to them before you talk to any other papers you don't have to d do anything or give them into just talk to them on the phone before mm. you talk to any other newspaper two thousand pounds is in, in your bank account wow and then there was just a week of just absolute total craziness where yeah. i had to lines at the time because mm. at the time before most people had mobiles and uh Ben Elton, who I was friends with, he was now famous, and he had two landlines. He had a landline that you know that, that where people knew the you know he gave the number out. Then he had another landline where he it was a secret number that only a few close relatives and friends had. Hmm. And because I sort of you know, looked up to Ben and I liked it, I I bought <laughs> another landline for myself. So I had two landlines, even though I wasn't famous. So my and somehow both of my landlines were ringing all the time. Hmm. Um, uh, it was all you know tv programs not just in britain but like mm. you know in america and you know bloomberg news and all sorts of things they're all phoning up asking for an interview and what would happen would be they phone up i'd answer the phone they'd say you know hi this is itv you know carlton tv we want you to be on the paul rush show this friday and i'd say how much would you pay and whatever amount of money they said i'd laugh and hang up and just wait for the phone to ring again. <laughs> it, was, it was insane, and all and all this happened um, only a short, only a few weeks before Princess Diana was killed. Oh, and right. of course, if this had happened after Princess Diana, had, you know, been killed, it would have been nothing. But anyway, another very long-winded reply to your uh, question. Uh, people were saying to me, "You should get Max Clifford to handle your story mm. because I was just inundated." I mean, like, there, there was a thing where I would do a thing called the Naked Balloon Dance hmm. um, with a comedian called Malcolm Hardy, really fantastic comedian, who unfortunately um, fell off his boat in the River Thames estuary when he was drunk and drowned. But he was a lovely bloke and a brilliant... He was he was a sort of celebrity celebrity. When he yeah. got married, Jonathan Ross gave him his suit to wear, you know, I mean, he, he knew all the famous people. Hmm. And... Um, and he uh, and I and another person did this uh, old routine, sort of Victorian music hall routine, but with balloons called the Naked Balloon Dance. And we were doing it in front of adults in an adult show that week in Bath at some theatre festival or something in Bath. And the tabloids got photographs of us, cut the other two blokes out, just had me naked but with the balloons, and then had this story about he was moonlighting as a naked balloon dancer and tried to make it seem as cheesy as possible. But it turned out that Malcolm, because he was a bit of a lovable rogue, he sold those photographs for three thousand right. pounds. Uh, so um, uh, I knew that you know there was loads of money uh, to do something on me, and mm. obviously it was my story, my pain. If anyone was going to get paid, I should be the one who got paid. And um, then I hadn't heard from Ragdoll. I, I when I'd got been fired, I'd gone off, you know politely and you know without making a fuss got in the car driven back to london and then um um uh, i think on the tuesday night or the wednesday night of that week my phone rang after midnight and someone said hello i'm so and so from ragdoll productions and i'm phoning you from ragdoll to give you a friendly warning mm -hmm. that there's a lot of money to do a sex scandal on you and then he hung mm -hmm. up <laughs> I've got a children's TV program phoning me up after midnight, telling me that there's a lot of money to do a writing to do a sex scandal on me. So anyway, uh, I then phoned Max Clifford, and uh, 
Max Clifford handled my case. He was also Princess Diana's publicist, as well as, you know, I mean, anyone who was huge, he was their publicist. Mm. Um, very sadly, of course, he ended up in prison and, and died in prison. Mm. My experience of him, that he was he was fine. He was a very uh, decent guy to deal with. Yeah. So um, what was the sex scandal that you uh, eventually gave to the press? Um, well, uh, I didn't, I was offered huge amounts of money to do something on one of the other Teletubbies yeah. or someone working on a doll, but I'm not that sort of person and I wasn't that sort of person. I didn't do that. I didn't take the huge, huge amount of money. So I did one on myself and Max Clifford said, what you need is to do um, something uh, involving a sex act involving you. And I quote him with a blonde girl, preferably with big tits um, <laughs> on, on or near the Teletubbies location. Right. So I got an ex-girlfriend who fitted that description. And um, we did the, um, I did the sex scandal. And I wouldn't do it now, but I did, at the time, I, I decided to go for the money and do it. Not the big money, but the less big money. Mm. And I paid off the mortgage on my flat in London. But if I could live it again, because I sort of lost the moral high ground. Up to that point, I had the moral high ground because I'd been messed about and I'd been sacked and mm. I'd been lied to. But once I did that... I lost all the moral high ground and probably, you know, it might have been if I hadn't done that, then one day maybe I'd have been invited to the Christmas parties of Ragdoll or whatever. But yeah. after that, I don't know where ever going to invite me to the Christmas party. Um, and I definitely was, you know, not on the Christmas card list from then on. Uh, yeah, hmm. I, I I haven't. It's, it's um uh, 10 past eight in Cambodia where I am and I haven't eaten yet. It's 10 past eight in the evening oh, and right. I haven't eaten yet. I'm very hungry. I okay. spent the whole day going around and to what? Yeah. <laughs> um, like a uh, would you like to end it then? Is that okay? So I'll let you go off and eat. Um, if you don't mind, because I've also got people waiting for me. Yeah, sure, mate. Yeah, no it's problem at all. I've given you enough for free. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks again, Dave. You've been brilliant. It's been really interesting talking to you. Oh, good. Well, um, stay in touch. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you want to so too, Maybe we can sort it out sometime, possibly when I've got better Wi-Fi and possibly when I've got my high-definition webcam. Perfect. Do, do send me the link to when you, if you ever, if you decide it's worth putting online, do send it to me and I'll share it on my social media. Oh, perfect. So we'll do, mate, yeah. Okay, great, mate. Well, enjoy your food and thanks again. Okay, well, thanks, Sean. It's nice to meet you finally and um, it's nice talking to you. And... Um, I hope the weather in Glasgow is nicer than when it was when I was there. <laughs> Grey and snowy, but thank you, mate. You take care. Thank you. All right. Cheers, Sean. Take Cheers, care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.